Chapter 7. Girls. The single largest plurality of a man's life will be spent in the pursuit of girls. You will go to clubs to meet girls. You will go to parties to meet girls. You will spend hours on the internet flirting with girls. You will spend years in college and decades at work to attract girls. If you think about it, nearly all of your conscious time on this planet is either directly or indirectly spent on getting girls. While at first this may seem a bit pathetic, understand there is nothing wrong or pathetic about it, as you are psychologically hardwired and genetically programmed to want, desire, and pursue women. It's very natural, and truthfully, there's something wrong with you if you don't have this biological imperative, the exception of gay men duly noted. But because of this, women present an incredible risk. They are likely to be your greatest single source of happiness, just as they are the greatest single source of pain and misery. They will consume the greatest amount of your time and resources, an investment of which may never pay off. You see this risk play out in everyday life. The sad, cowardly nerd who never gets the courage to approach women and, consequently, lets their absence ruin his life. The reliable, stable family man, father of three, happy as he can be, until she delivers the divorce papers. The high school football captain or player who has a full scholarship and a bright future, until he knocks up the wrong girl. Or the desperate middle-aged man who orders a mail-order bride until she leaves him once she gets her green card. The examples are endless, but you get the point. Women can be the single greatest blessing or curse in your life. Because of this, the topic of women, how to pursue them, how to be successful with them, and, above all else, how to do it effectively and economically, is arguably the most important part of this book. The problem is the sheer scope and breadth required to thoroughly address the topic of women. For millions of years, men have opined, theorized, and speculated about the nature of women and have still come up with nothing. And one lowly chapter, let alone a thousand books on the topic, will fail in the same regard. However, instead of approaching the topic of women by attempting to address each and every one of their eccentricities with the corresponding advice or wisdom, which has never worked anyway, it is best to take a top-down approach about women, operating from a model or general theory, and from there fill in the specific details and advice. The economic model. Religious leaders will contest, psychologists will argue, feminists will scream, and your mother will disapprove. But the cold hard truth is that the relationship between men and women is not explained through religion, psychology, politics, feminist theory, or your mother's time-tested wisdom, but rather economics. Specifically, supply and demand. Supply and demand for what? Supply and demand for sex. If you hearken back to your high school economics class, you will remember that economics is all about people who supply a good and people who demand it. These suppliers and demanders meet in a market, negotiate and haggle, finally settling on an equilibrium price for said good, and then draw some funky charts. And in this particular market, it is women who are the suppliers of sex and men who are the demanders of sex. The question is, how do men pay for sex? And the answer is key, as well as a vital insight into the psychology of women with attention. Attention is the currency all women crave. Women crave attention so much, one could argue it is actually the men who are the suppliers of attention, and sex is the currency that women pay for it with. But neither here nor there, it is generally assumed in psychosexual economic circles that women supply sex and men pay for it. However, it isn't simply just a matter of lavishing a woman with attention and she starts disrobing. If that were the case, any nerd could flood the captain of the cheerleading team with texts and notes and end up nailing her in the locker room during lunch hour. There is something else going on. Enter Sexual Market Value. Sexual Market Value, or SMV, is the concept that one person is sexually more desirable than another. So if you have a handsome man who works as an investment banker, his sexual market value is higher than, say, a fat single mom on her third divorce. Keeping consistent with the economic model, your SMV is very much like your currency or cachet. If you are trading in US dollars, it is unlikely you would be trading with people in Venezuelan pesos. Conversely, people trading in gold are unlikely to trade with you. This puts the entirety of your romantic and sexual success with women in your ability to increase your sexual currency or SMV. How this is done is very simple. Figure out what the opposite sex wants and deliver. It is here our forefathers haven't completely wasted their time. For the most part, everyone knows what men want in women and what women want in men. Men want a woman who has big tits, a tight ass, long legs, long hair, youth, nobody else's children, isn't a financial or legal risk, and 
isn't batshit insane. Women want a man who has money, brute strength, security, charm, leadership, confidence, intelligence, who's a bit dangerous, and is a badass. The real issue is whether people are actually willing to invest the time and resources to achieve these qualities and traits, and therefore attract a mate. And if you look at the general population, most people aren't. The majority of Americans, both men and women, are fat, obese, lazy, unattractive, uninteresting, boring, mundane wastes of human protoplasm that inspire neither attraction nor desire from the opposite sex. They'd rather watch TV, stuff their faces, watch internet porn, read Harlequin romance novels, and come up with any excuse to avoid improving themselves. The result is a slothful population that lives their sexual and romantic lives vicariously through celebrities, the movies, and the internet. However, this is actually an opportunity for you. With such low and decreasing standards, you have very little competition. Matter of fact, if you can run just three miles without dying by the age of 35, you are already physically in the top 20% of men that age. The issue is whether you are willing to commit the effort and discipline to achieving the above traits. Some of these traits are actually easy to obtain over time. Others just plain suck and are going to be a chore for the rest of your life. And some just plain don't make any sense, especially to a younger man. But a review of the importance of each of them, as well as an explanation of why women view them as attractive, will hopefully not only explain why you should attain such traits, but provide the necessary incentive to achieve them.